Today is a, a famous birthday of Wayne Gretzky. If you're Canadian, that's a big deal, right? Canadian, eh? Yeah. He's 58 today. He's a, yeah, the great one hockey player. <laughs> if you're a Canadian hockey fan, I know there's one in the house. So. Or a Gretzky fan, yeah? True. Yes. I never actually got to watch him play, so. Yes. <laughs> okay, so a few weeks ago, we had a special event after church on a Sunday, and a few of us went out to celebrate that uh, special event, and that was the dunking of an individual in here, Rosa. So Rosa, could you come up here? Rosa, come on up. There you go. The baptismal certificate. Yes. She was the only person, I mean, not that I've baptized a whole bunch of people, but she got so excited in that water. She came up and did one of these splashes in my face. And, and uh, I said, you know what? And then took a victory lap in the pool. The, the lifeguard was looking around going, I think these people are a little, oh, I think these people are a little, uh, little off the rocker a bit, trying to come in with a bang. It's been a couple weeks. Give me a break. <laughs> okay, so 1980, Mary Decker became the first woman to run the mile under four and a half minutes. Okay, wow, that's pretty impressive. Um, and then some of you might remember this in 1939. Uh, just kidding. <laughs> uh, filming began with Gone with the Wind. And so, which leads me to my next question. And I know some of you pray for us when we go away. Um, just pray for us in general, because, you know, being in leadership, whatever your capacity is, praying for leaders is really a good thing to be doing because we want to be hearing from God and not just doing things of, out of our own strength. So I know that people in here spend time praying for us. What I, I think something was missed on this last week because I could picture people praying like a wind to come in and really blow in our sails, but they missed the one word which was a warm wind to blow in our sails because it was the people that we, we went and we had a house down there and and the woman said, oh, we've never turned the heat on. And <laughs> you have no idea. I just came from Fargo. Let me tell you, it, it's coming. I can see it on the news. They're talking about iguanas falling. I mean, it was, you know, I, we get there. <laughs> that's a whole nother subject so it was a really interesting thing to to be in florida and um and have a cold front move through where it was in the high 30s i mean people were like it looked like a walk-in yard sale everywhere you went because nobody had matching hats and mittens i mean they just grabbed whatever they could they got a you know tablecloth around their head just as a scarf or whatever i mean it, it looked like a yard sale um, where did you get that outfit? Because <laughs> they're not used to having winter coats. So they just grabbed anything out of their closet. And then we came, we found out when we were down there, this was really a cool uh, part of the trip. We found out that we were like five minutes away from a family member who had been admitted into a rehab for uh, falling down, really took a nasty fall and had been in this rehab for, for quite some time. And so... Karen said to me, hey, what do you think? We'll, we'll go over there and, and do a visit. And I said, sure. And usually when I say sure, there's, a, there's something that God is up to. And there's a, there's a behind the scenes thing that's going on. And I'm not aware of it. I'm kind of like Mickey the Dunce just kind of going along for the ride. Well, we show up and we get in and we visit and we, we start talking back and forth. And it was really great to see him. I hadn't seen him for a long time. 
But then I heard the question, is there anything that we can do for you? And, and then I heard the answer. Well, I don't have my cell phone. And I thought, I think I know where this is going. And, and then, then they said, and I don't have the key to the house or the condo. And I'm like, uh-oh. Now I really know where this is going. Well, let's figure out a way to get into your house. And it's, it starts off with this innocent discussion, which leads to a pastor from New England with New Jersey license plates breaking into a condo. To get, <laughs> I mean, can you see the headline now? So, you know, yes, we got permission from the owner, but what does it look like to the neighbors? You know, and of course, my wife is just, loves the adventure side of it and i'm more of a conservative like you know we gotta like what's the plan here we're just jumping in the car going over what's going to happen is there a guard you know do we know any of the neighbors names can we you know how's this going to work and so we drive over there it wasn't that far and uh we pull in and we're looking for m203 or whatever it was and we pull in the spot there's m203 right there she's like right there pull in right there okay all right calm down we'll get there pull in (laughs) And uh, she's excited because, you know, we're doing something. We're going to help somebody. This is good. And, um, and I'm for it. And so something in me is saying, just slow down a minute and look around. Like, wait. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, I don't know, hon. Something, something's, something's not right. And she goes, come on. Don't worry about it. Oh, you're overthinking it. Let's just go. Let's... So I go to get out of the car and I look up. And I see the number on the building. Well, we're supposed to be going to 1290, 1294 or something. We're at 1200. So each building in the place has M203. Every building does. So here we are getting ready to get out of the car to go jimmy someone's lot or whatever we're going to do to get in here. And it's not even his house. I go, Eve, let's get in the car. Let's go. (laughs) And... and like oh I, I guess I kind of got that one you think like you know you hear these horrible stories of you know and you know Florida is a gun state down there so you open up somebody's door I don't know what's on the other side of that this is what I'm thinking so anyways we pull into the parking spot and we get the uh, we get in um, inconspicuously we we walk in and we get the phone and we get everything and we get back so you know it worked out it worked out well, but you know there was questions along the way. There was a mystery that was that was really happening for me in my head. I had all these questions, and I didn't have any real answers to to how this was going to unfold. And you know, it it made me think about a, <clears throat> you know trust, and when we when we trust in things, or when we trust in people, or when we trust in a circumstance, there's security when we know that we can trust something. But then when what happens when we're in those circumstances or there's something there that we don't really have the answer because we haven't put enough weight on that to trust it. Like there hasn't been an experience or there hasn't been a, a circumstance where we're able to put trust into. So do you like the unknown? No. There's not many people that would say, yeah, I love it. I love when stuff happens when I don't know what's going to happen. Like my wife likes that. Like, that's crazy to me. And she thrives on it. Like, God. He, see, God knew. He's like, Paul, I'm going to get you out of your comfort zone. I'm going to bring you this wife. And you're, it's just going to be an adventure. Like, so strap in and just hold on. You know? And that's what it feels like day to day. Do you like having answers to questions? Yes, we do. Right? Do you, do you enjoy not being in control? Mm, that's a big one. You know, sometimes we we I, I just I'm going off script here. Um, we 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 lean on those things that we have control over, like we gravitate towards those versus things that we don't. <clears throat> I know for me, it's somewhat easy to get into work and do work stuff because I have a lot of control over how that thing works out. Um, I want to take a look at some scripture this morning. If you have your Bibles, or we'll pull it up, pull it up on the screen. It's in First uh, Kings 17. This is after Elijah shows up on the scene. 
And Elijah is a prophet, and a lot of people don't like him. And there's a reason they don't like him. Because the words that he speaks seem to bring trouble to those in charge. You know, he speaks things out that um, really disrupt what the plan is for the king, uh, how things are going. So I just want to read through that with the backdrop of, um, of trust. Starting at verse 8. Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go and live in the village of Zarephath, near the city of Zidon. I have instructed a widow there to feed you. So he went to Zarephath. As he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks, and he asked her, Would you please bring me a cup of water? As she was going to get it, he called to her, Bring me a bite of bread too. The nerve of this guy. But she said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house, and I have only a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of a jug of the jug. I was gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal, and then my son and I will die. But Elijah said to her, Don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just, of, just what you've said. But make a little bread for me first. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. There will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends the rain and the crops grow again. Now, this is during a time of drought. So that's the, the backdrop to that. So she really is in, in dire straits of needing food and water and um, just the necessities to, to live. So she did as Elijah said. And she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. There was also enough flour and olive oil left in the, in the containers, just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. Sometime later, the woman's son became sick. He grew even worse and worse and finally died. Then she said to Elijah, O oh man of God, what have you done to me? Have you come to point out my sins and kill my son? But Elijah replied, Give me your son. And he took the child's body from her arms and carried him upstairs to the room where he was where he was staying. He laid the body on his bed. Then Elijah cried out, Lord, oh my God, why have you brought this tragedy to this widow who has opened her home to me, causing her son to die? Now this is the crazy part. As he stretched himself out over the child three times and cried out to the Lord, oh my God, please let this child's life return to him the Lord heard Elijah's prayers, and the life of the child returned, and he was revived. Then Elijah brought him down from the upper room and gave him to his mother. Look, he said, your son is alive. Then the woman told Elijah, now I know for sure you are a man of God, and that the Lord truly speaks through you. Interesting. Interesting. That is an amazing story of God listening to prayers and Elijah trusting in God to do that. But the widow had some questions and she didn't really have answers. So if we look at some of the questions that she had, one is more of a statement but almost posed as a question is, I only have this amount. So she's basically saying, I don't know what you're thinking, but you want bread, we need bread, there's not enough bread, what's going to happen here? The second question comes when we look at what she's saying is, what have you done to me? So now she's looking at Elijah saying, okay, almost forgetting the fact that 
everything's been filled in the cabinets, but now saying, what have you done? And why are you bringing this on to me? Is it, why, are you, why did you come to point out my sin? And why are you trying to take my son away? What's happening? And then number three, you have, you have come to point out and, and kill my son. So there's, when we look at what she's asking Elijah, is she's really, she has seen stuff happen through Elijah. But now, she's not seeing God move. So there's questions. There's, you could almost sense a lack of trust, right? God has moved before. He filled the containers. He filled the cabinets. And now, right now, I don't know what you're doing, but it's not, it's not good. Because she's looking at the circumstance, rightly so. Each one of us have circumstances in our life. God has done something before in our life and has brought us through something, but yet now we're facing this new situation and we're like, oh, I don't know if he's going to come through on this one. Have you been there? I've been there many times. It's so easy to get to that place. We start to question. But see, questions are good. Having questions builds faith. Because if we're not questioning any, anything, if we're not having those questions, there really isn't an opportunity for God to show His power, to show the things that He's doing in our life. See, just because her faith or her trust was waning didn't mean that God was giving up. Didn't mean that God wasn't hearing the prayer. Doesn't, doesn't mean when you're in a situation and you're like, you're not feeling trustworthy towards the Lord, that He's not going to work in your life. You know, the follow-up to that condo visit in Florida, going in and, you know, I'm questioning the whole time. Is this a God thing? <laughs> like, I hope it is. I don't really know. It's not really feeling like it. We almost went in the wrong building. Now we're over here. And, um, you know, I, it's just... I'm I'm tossing around in my head, but I tell you what, when we handed that cell phone over and his face lit up and he was able to contact his son, that was a God thing. God was moving in it. But earlier that day, it didn't feel like it at all. I'm like, this is crazy. See, if we don't have questions, we believe we have all the answers. If you don't have questions, you think you have all the answers. You know, those questions can be, is this God? Is God doing something in this? What is God doing? Just like she asked, why is this happening? Like, what's going on? And then, how is He using this? You ever ask that question? God, how are you using this? We know scriptures of, you know, God uses all things for good for those who love Him and are called according to His purposes. We like know those scriptures. But yet when you're sitting in it, man, it doesn't feel like that, does it? You're like, well, how are you using this? So we don't have the end picture. We don't have the end game. We don't, we're not at that last paragraph where she looks at him and says, now I know you are a man of God. Think about that. She filled the, filled the jars, filled the baskets, filled, filled the house with food. And, and it takes time over and over and over again, sometimes for us to get it, to say, you know what? That's God. God is moving in this. It takes time. And sometimes when we can, we can, we can focus too much on the end result and miss the fact that, yes, God is in this. God is moving in this. But I just love that, um, just by that last sentence where she says, now I know for sure, for sure, for sure. I mean, how many times have, have I like looked at things and been like, I think it's God. And then all of a sudden, you can see the bigger picture. You know, the child comes back to life, so to speak, whatever that is. And you're like, yeah, I know that for sure. That was God. You know, we're, we're looking at this lease and we believe it's God. Why do we believe it's God for this building? Well, because a lot of us have been praying for it. A lot of us have been saying how it would be a benefit. And some of the 
pieces of the puzzle coming together and we've been waiting and waiting and waiting for the right property to be available. Is it the most ideal property? Probably not. Is it something that God wants us to walk into to to kind of set up a foundation and then build upon? That's what we believe it is. But really, we have to trust in God in this process. We have to trust that He's going to be with us through this. You know, do your due diligence all the same, but there is a level of trust that, okay, you know, once we sign this lease, it's a commitment. We have to stay in that commitment for a year and then see what God does with it. We believe it. We believe it is. I trust that I won't trip over that mat again. <laughs> and, you know, the, the, the thing that is interesting about Elijah is that the king at the time had a, had a wife. She wasn't that good. She wasn't a nice woman. And she had made some threats against Elijah. Her name was Jezebel. And so it didn't take, I mean, here's a man of God. And this should bring hope for all of us. Because here's a man of God that raised a child from the dead after laying over him, praying, God hearing his prayers, filling jars, doing all sorts of miracles. and. Someone threatens his life, and what happens? He says, take my life, Lord. Like, he wants to give it up. He wants to surrender right there and say, this isn't worth living. What? Are you kidding me? Look at how God is using you. And he's ready to throw in the chips and say it's over. I mean, that's sometimes the reality of where we walk sometimes. We allow ourselves and we allow others to dictate in our head who we are, what we should be doing, what we shouldn't be doing, blah, blah, blah. It just goes on. And a guy that raises a child from the dead, a man of God who's been challenged many times by kings, is now threatened by Jezebel and wants to end it. And he's, that's where his head's at. So that should bring hope for all of us. Because, you know, there are times when you feel like God's not moving. You're not trusting in that space wherever wherever that space is and god's not going to give up on you see god didn't say oh you know what elijah that's it you're done you said i heard what you said you said you wanted out that's it you gave up i'm giving up on you he didn't say that but he took a spiritual tailspin has anyone done a spiritual tailspin before (laughs) oh yeah the laughs mean yep what does that mean well for me, the times that, geez, I'm not really feeling like the Lord's doing anything in my life. Um, I'm not really spending any time with the Lord. Like, I can't even worship. It's like knuckle drag worship. Uh, like, right? It's true. Read a, a verse, John 14, verse 1 through 4. And this is Jesus speaking. So let this really sink into your heart. Don't. Let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I am going. And Jesus is saying he is the way. And it's in his father's house is where he's, he's prepared a place for each one of us that call Jesus Lord. And he's saying, put your trust in me. Put it in God, put it in me. And when we, when we read that, does that bring our level of anxiety down? It depends. Depends. It really depends on where your heart's at. There's a level of trust in that, in that scripture when we read that, when we know that Jesus said that. He said that, yes, in those times, but that is also being said to us, the living word, to us, to you, where you are today. Do you trust in that scripture? See, the good news is the unconditional love of the Father is not weighed upon or valued at the level of trust that we have in Him. 
He just unconditionally loves us. I'm not saying it's an excuse to not trust him. What I'm saying is take encouragement in those times when you feel less than on trust in the Lord. Trust him. And when you feel like you're not trusting him, pray, Father, I don't trust you in this. Help me. Help my heart. You know, he wants honest prayers from us. He doesn't want showy stuff. He doesn't want us to sound like we have it all together and stuff, you know. Yeah, he just wants a, a you know a heart that wherever you're at, bring it to the Lord. I want to read a little story of a guy that most will know if you if you if you're a worshiper or worship or you play worship, you know him, uh, Zach Williams. I think he did Chainbreaker, if I'm not mistaken. And um, yeah, let me just uh, read that. I grew up. In a very Christian home, very, so that's not a Christian home, that's a very Christian home. I don't know what that means, but it's important because it's in there, it says very. Um, I kind of know what that means, but I don't want to. My dad led worship and my mom sang on the worship team with him. We were in church every Sunday and every Wednesday. Where's Carly at? See, this guy had to go Sunday and Wednesday. (laughs) Just saying. Thanks, Dad. Thank you, Dad. I love you, Dad. (laughs) My parents really planted that seed in that foundation in me at an early age in my life. Honestly, I get to talk about it a lot, but I know had it not been for that, I wouldn't be here. I hear people talk about it all the time. Train your child up in the ways of the Lord. And that was it. Had it not been for their relationship with God and just serving as the example they were to myself and others, just the example for Christ that they were. I wouldn't be here and wouldn't have these opportunities. I wouldn't have known that there was a God or anything to come back to at home. But like most kids, we've all got to find our way. We think we know more than our parents. And that was the case for me. When I turned 15 or 16, everything that I had been taught, everything that I knew about God, who God was, the world keep kind of creeps in into everything. I started experimenting with drugs and alcohol. I started running around with the wrong crowd. By my senior year in high school, I was making really bad decisions. I lost a basketball scholarship and found myself jumping out of high school the last semester of my senior year. I got a GED and I went to work for my dad's construction company. I thought, well, here it is, my life's over. What am I going to do now? I just remember that my parents never judged me, that they were never, they were never ultimatums from them. They were all, always supported and prayed for me. I can look back now and say, man, how hard was it for my mom and dad to see me live this other life? How can they stay strong in their faith? They continued to pray for me, and they knew God had a plan for my life. They used to pray Jeremiah 29, 11 over me. And I remember trying to understand what, actu- what that actually meant. Just recently, I really discovered that they spoke this over me as I was growing up. So in my late 20s, early 30s, here I am. I've been trying to be this rock star and live a new lifestyle that I've created for myself. All I've ever done is fail, stumble, fall, and hit dead-end road after dead-end road. Here I was, 30 years old, walking through the darkest times because I was trying to figure out what was I doing with my life. I just found myself at the end of my rope. The only thing left was to cry out to God, and that was it. I remember coming home from a tour in 2012 when I was 33 years old. My wife had just had our second child together. It was our fourth child as a family. And we were in the middle of deciding 
whether we would make this work or get a divorce. Are we going to try and salvage a marriage, this marriage, in this relationship? And I just remember that God really showed himself to me on that tour. <clears throat> I came home, I remember falling on my hands and knees on my bedroom floor, not knowing what I was praying. I didn't know what I was saying, but I knew that I was sick and tired of this life. I was asking God to just come and save me from this life I had created. I just remember feeling this immediate relief for the first time, not feeling like I had somebody sitting on my chest. It was like this breath that I could breathe. I realized I don't have to go back to that life anymore. I can do anything I want in life. I never turned back and wanted to go backwards. God started revealing himself to me and showing me this plan that he had, that he has had for my life all along. Part of that was I'm going to live through some dark days and I'm going to see some things a lot of people don't see. But now that I've gone through it, I am realizing that there are a lot of us that do live through, it, through that, in that and they go through that. Here's the cool thing. He's allowed my story to be something that I can share with people to show people the goodness of who God is and what he can do with somebody's life. And you can see the level of trust that in his life, even though there were times early on in his life that he, he had trusted God, he had seen the example through his parents, and there's some level of trust. As he walked this out, there was a deeper level that he had to get to. There was a deeper level of trust in God, in his relationship with God, that he had to get to. And I think that happens a lot of times with each one of us. We go through these seasons, and sometimes when things seem unstable, it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to trust God more and more and more. Let me pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for everyone here. Lord, as we um, look to you to whatever capacity we can, Lord. Lord, speak to us. And help us trust you more. Lord, I pray that you would show us, that you would show each person here, that you would bring back memories of times that you've shown up time and time again. That hope would flow in right now. Come Holy Spirit. Move in this place. Move among your people. 